Hello and welcome to Neurosurgery at Rittenborg Crash Course. My name is Chen and we'll be talking about hippocampal formation today. We kind of mentioned the hippocampus a lot in previous videos, but the hippocampus is divided into a head, a body, and a tail. And we covered in the septal area video that there is a structure called the indicium griseum which is the terminal extension of the hippocampus that loops around immediately on top of the corpus callosum into the septal area. And you, you can refer to the septal area video for more information. When you take a coronal view of the brain, you will see the hippocampus in the medial temporal lobe. And when you magnify it, and take a look in detail, the hippocampus have many more components. The first of these is the dentate gyrus, right in the center. This is actually a separate structure wrapping around at the end of the hippocampus proper. The hippocampus proper is this region known as the cornu a minus CA4, 3, 2, and 1, in that order. And after the CA1 comes an area called the subiculum. The subiculum represents a transitional area between the hippocampus proper and the entorhinal area. And sometimes the subiculum is lumped together with the structures that are indicated by a pro-subiculum, pre-subiculum, para, post-subiculum that are immediately adjacent to the subiculum area. And then eventually the cortex transitions into the entorhinal cortex. And so therefore the there is some confusion with naming because the hippocampal proper is strictly speaking just the area that is named CA1 through CA4 with the hippocampal formation referring to the hippocampus proper plus the dentate gyrus and the subiculum and so the hippocampal formation is this entire area whereas the hippocampal proper is just this area. Hippocampus proper is named cornu amanus because the shape of the hippocampus proper looks like the horn of an Egyptian or Greek god Amon, and hence the name. Now there are four segments in the hippocampal proper, namely CA4, 3, 2, and 1 with CA4 immediately adjacent to the dentate gyrus and CA1 adjacent to the subiculum. I used to remember this because the dentate, the letter D, is the fourth letter in the alphabet and it's right next to CA4. Now the hippocampus as a whole has only three cortical layers in their gray matter and is considered archipallium. And as you transition out of the hippocampus, you enter the region of the parahippocampal gyrus, which is considered just regular cortex, which is the isocortex with six layers in the gray matter. And you, you can refer to the neocortex video for more information. There are a few important anatomical structures related to the hippocampus. Right next to the hippocampus proper, you have the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. And the hippocampus is also surrounded by the choroid plexus. At the bottom of the brain, there is a sulcus, 
that correlates to this sulcus right here called the collateral sulcus. And notice how close this sulcus is to the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. And that is a very important anatomical relation to remember for the board exam and in real life. The other very important anatomical structure to remember is the choroidal fissure. The choroidal fissure is the site of attachment of the, cho uh, the choroid plexus in the lateral ventricle. The choroidal fissure is divided into three parts, but at this location, at the temporal part, it is situated in the temporal horn between the fimbria of the fornix and the lower surface of the thalamus in the medial part of the lateral ventricle. Now this is important because opening through this structure, the temporal portion of the choroid, choroidal fissure from the temporal horn exposes the structures in the ambient and choral cisterns. Another board favorite thing to remember is that the CA1 region is especially susceptible to damage from hypoxia or excital toxicities after a seizure than any other locations within the hippocampal uh, formation, with the CA4 immediately following that of CA1. Signals going in and out of the hippocampus happens in many ways, in many tracks. We've talked about a few of them in previous videos. The entorhinal cortex, which is another way of saying anterior parahippocampal gyrus, as we have seen in previous slides, goes directly into the hippocampus. The cingulate gyrus is a direct continuation of the parahippocampal gyrus that then will go into the hippocampus. The medial septal nucleus can get to the amygdalal hippocampal complex in different ways. As we talked about in the septal area video, the septal nucleus can go send signal via the diagonal band of Broca into the amygdala that then will convert information within the amygdala hippocampal complex. And we will talk about the how septal nucleus connects with the fornix very shortly. In terms of the output, it's rather simple. You, you can only get, go one of two ways. You can either go to the fornix or you can go through the cortex via the subiculum into the entorhinal cortex. The fornix is a C-shaped nerve bundle that starts in the hippocampus and travels around, forms almost like an arch, and hence its name, fornix, because it's Latin for arch, and ends in the mammillary body. And this structure is the major output to the hippocampus. And notice how close in relation this structure, the fornix, is with the foramen of Monroe. And hence, if you have a colloid cyst, how easy that may affect your memory. The starting point of the fornix next to the hippocampal proper is called the fimbria. The fimbria then travels to the crus of the fornix into the fornix commissure that then becomes the body at which point it meets an important structure, the anterior commissure, and it's the fornix splits into a pre-commissural fibers and a post 
commish roll fibers. And a little bit of the fibers that also goes to thalamus. The pre-commish roll fibers is named because it's anterior to the anterior commissure. This, these fibers are relatively small and they go to the septal nuclei. The post commissural fibers, named because it's posterior to the anterior commissure, goes into the mammillary bodies. And note that both the pre commissural fibers and the post commissural fibers are both anterior to the foramen of Monroe. While we're on the topic, the anterior commissure is a white matter tract that connects between the two temporal lobes of the, of the hemisphere across the midline. It's easily identifiable on a mid-sagittal view by this little nubbit right there. And on an MRI scan, if you take a coronal slice right across the anterior commissure, you're going to see a white band of white matter tracks right across that connects the two hemispheres. And as this diagram shows, the anterior commissure connects between the two temporal lobes. We have talked about the fornix as one of the output tracks. The other output pathway is the subiculum, which serves as the main output for hippocampus and dentate gyrus, and is actually the sole direct cortical projector for the hippocampus and the dentate gyrus. Now the input and output tracks actually forms a loop. And among all the input we talked about earlier, the main input to the hippocampus is from the entorhinal cortex, which receives input from multiple cortical areas in all sensory modalities. The first set of signals travel from the entorhinal cortex to the dentate gyrus. And this is part of what's called the perforant pathway. The dentate gyrus receives information only from the entorhinal cortex. And it actually does not have any extrinsic projections None, but it only projects within the hippocampus to CA3. The, after the dentate gyrus projects to CA3, signals then transfer from CA3 to CA1. And this signal then goes to the subiculum and exit out of the hippocampal formation into the entorhinal cortex. And therefore, the loop is formed. And this set of synapses has a name which is called the trisynaptic circuit because it's got three major synapses listed here in a diagram to illustrate the circuit. And here's a summary of the major output tracks and their destinations. And we have talked about the fornix going to the mammillary bodies via the post commish roll column and going into the septal area via the pre commish roll column and a small little branch that goes to the anterior thalamic nucleus. And the subiculum being the major cortical output tracks that is directly continuous with the perihippocampal cortex that is then directly continuous with the cingulate gyrus which is also continuous with the 
medial frontal cortex in the septal area. And this is part of what's considered the circuit of Pappies or the limbic system that you can get more information from in the limbic system overview video. So the hippocampus is involved in memory formation and more specifically in the recent memories, uh, but not remote memories. And if you have a lesion, say uh, a stimulation or a seizure of this region, you get a temporary impairment of consciousness characterized by the psychic symptoms or automatic behaviors, such as lip smacking. Uh, and there is no apparent convulsion uh, like the tonic-clonic type, but there will be amnesia. The patient typically appears drowsy, intoxicated, but normal activities such as dining, typing, eating may continue at automatic levels. And the psychic symptoms are uh, typically visual and auditory hallucinations, deja vu feelings, uh, and it may be accompanied by uh, visceral symptoms such as a chest pain or GI discomfort or an increased heart rate. These are my references. Uh, I hope you find this helpful, and we'll see you next time.